Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. It's a blessing to be in the Lord's house and have you uh, join us. Uh, just want to share a few quick announcements with you as we begin our time together. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, uh, it's a little earlier than usual, but at 4 o'clock we have our church council meeting kind of talking about uh, this upcoming year, making some long-range plans and things of that nature. So if you're on one of those uh, those uh, positions there that is associated with our church council, we encourage you to be back today at 4 o'clock. And then at 5 o'clock, we have our connections. Uh, this is the last Sunday of the month, so this is an opportunity for us to connect with our friends and neighbors. Uh, tonight, we'll be spending time uh, looking at our, our neighborhood focus that we talked about on Vision Sunday. So I encourage you all to be back. We'll be uh, kind of assigning some different houses as far as prayer focus and, and things of that nature. So come back today at 5 o'clock, and then we won't have our regular evening service because we'll be focused on our outreach uh, emphasis this evening. Uh, you saw see other things in the bulletin. I do want to tell you this. Guys, put this on your radar. Next Sunday morning at 8.15, we'll have a men's prayer breakfast. All right? Uh, Kip and Josh have already been talking details. I mean, they got a, they got a whole spread planned, guys. It's going to be great. I've got a special guest coming in to be sharing with us. So all of our gentlemen, please come next week, 8.15. Meet down in the uh, fellowship hall. It gives you plenty of time before our uh, Sunday school and everything. And it'll be a great time of fellowship and I know you'll be blessed by it. And you'll hear more about that as the, as the week unfolds. I do want to share. Yes. Uh -huh. Choir will practice tonight at 7. Okay. So choir practice tonight at 7. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you reminding me of that. I do want to share <coughs> excuse me, a card with you uh, this morning. Um, it says this. These are the people. There are people in our lives that are, uh, who are genuinely kind-hearted. The preacher of them just comes naturally. Uh, to my Echota Church family, thank you. To each and every one, uh, our church family has been a blessing to myself and my family. Thank you for your prayers, messages, visits during this difficult time. Just knowing we have a church family that cares for me and my family is a gift from God. Your thoughtfulness is appreciated. Thank you so much, the Lily Fuller family. And this is from Lana and Jeff and Hannah and Josh. And so I just continue to remember them uh, in the days ahead and just thankful they are a part of, of our church family. Uh, as well as other prayer concerns uh, today, uh, you do want to continue to remember the Mullinax family. Um, Miss Jackie is is in the hospital. Many of you knew that. And if I'm not mistaken, the last I heard, she's on 100% oxygen. Uh, they've got her in the, the special care unit. Uh, so be in prayer for them uh, during this time. Um, what's the latest with Ronnie this morning? I know things were better than they're back on the, the BiPAP. Is that... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, all right, so definitely remember Ronnie as well. Um, what I'd like for us to do to begin our, our service this morning, I know there's other concerns and, and needs within our, <coughs> our fellowship as well. Just ask that you just uh, spend some time in, in silent prayer, uh, just you and the Lord, uh, lifting up those things that are on your heart, as well as these families that were known, uh, and then I'll, I'll close this. So let's, let's enter into a, a season of prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we, we thank you that you hear our prayers. And Lord, you are faithful to respond. Lord, we thank you for the time you've given us today to, to be together with our brothers and sisters in faith and those that are in pursuit of who you are and trying to make sense of things. And Lord, we thank you that you've brought them to our house today, to your house, to our fellowship and Lord, we do pray for those that aren't here. We pray for those that may be traveling or those that are under the weather. We just pray that your presence is known to them. Lord, we just pray for, for Ronnie this morning, Lord, as he uh, continues to, to fight against this illness. I pray that your, your hand would be on his life in a special way. And Lord, that Holy Spirit that resides in him because of the work that you've done in his heart, Lord, it works at healing his body as well. And Lord, that you continue to encourage uh, his precious family and and give them the strength to, to encourage Ronnie. Lord, we do pray for the Molinax family during this time. And Lord, I know their hearts are, are struggling right now as they, they rally around Miss Jackie. And I, I pray again, just as I prayed earlier, that that Holy Spirit that resides in her will, 
work in such a powerful way that, Lord, your glory is seen. Father, we trust all these things into your care, and we know that you hear the prayers of your people because of the work that your son, Jesus, has done on our behalf. So, Father, we pray now, it's that work that's brought transformation and hope to our lives that moves us to worship this morning. Which in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come and lead us, brother. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Our first hymn today is um, I Love to Tell a Story. It's number 572 in the hymn book. <clears throat> Good morning. So a couple weeks ago, I mean, Avery were <coughs> watching the TV show The Chosen. I know you guys have heard me talk about it a lot. And so there's this scene, uh, and for those of you who have never seen it, this is a retelling of the life of Jesus. Um, and a lot of the things that happen or occur uh, in the TV show are things that are not written in the Bible. Um, just kind of them trying to tell how they think certain, some of these things may have occurred. And so this particular episode takes place right after John the Baptist has been uh, arrested. And so you've got one group of disciples that are fearful, and they're like, hey, we need to tone it down some, and we need to limit the size of the crowds that are coming to hear Jesus speak, because as the crowds have gotten bigger, they're starting to attract the attention of the Romans. Um, and so... So, so that's one group, and then another group is like, hey, well, he, he seems to know what he's doing, so let's just continue to trust in him. And finally, one of them steps up and says, Jesus doesn't need passive followers. And when he said that, it, man, it just hit me. It was like, wow, that's a, 
that's part of the problem we have today is that we've kind of become a little passive. We, we lack that boldness to go out and proclaim God's word, uh, proclaim what God has done for us. Um, so my, the verse I'll be reading today, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, picking up in 18 through 20, uh, and this is right after uh, Paul talks about uh, putting on the armor of God. Uh, so in the, the verses preceding this, like the eight, eight or ten verses preceding this, he's talking about all these different um, pieces of armor to put on to help us each day. But as he gets to verse 18, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. But pray also for me that when I speak, my words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I should. Uh, so as followers of Christ, that should be our prayer every day, that we boldly um, proclaim the word of God, that we're no longer passive, that we don't sit around and wait for something to happen, but we seek opportunities to be able to share God's word. So uh, everybody will pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for, for your love and your grace and the mercy, Lord, that you show to us each and every day. We thank you, God, for sending your Son to, to die on a cross, Lord, uh, to show us the way, Lord. And God, we pray that as we leave here today and each morning as we wake up, Lord, that we make that decision, Lord, to bro boldly proclaim you and your love, uh, your message of salvation, Lord, to all we come in contact with. Lord, we do pray for those in our congregation who are battling sickness this morning, God. We just pray, Lord, that your healing hands would just touch their bodies. Lord, we pray for comfort for their families during this difficult time. Lord, we pray for our pastor uh, as he comes forth in a few minutes. Lord, we just pray, God, you give him the words that we need to hear today, Lord. For all these things we ask in your mighty and powerful name. Amen. Right, let's stand again. We have heard the joyful sound, 581. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. One word our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Her shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph for the tomb, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shall salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves.
got children come forward at this time <laughs> God spoke to Moses on the mountain and gave him very specific instructions for building a tabernacle. The tabernacle would be a huge tent that the Israelites could take with them wherever they went. God would meet with his people in the tabernacle. Moses told the Israelites everything that God had said. He asked them to bring materials, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen and goat hair, animal skins, wood, oil, spices, and gemstones. God gave two men, Bezalel and Oholiab, special skills for crafting things. Bezalel and Oholiab and all the other skilled craftsmen came together to build the tabernacle. The people kept bringing offerings. Pretty soon, the craftsmen told Moses, the people are bringing more than enough. We don't need all this. So Moses told the Israelites to stop bringing their offerings. The craftsmen built the tabernacle just as God instructed. The tabernacle had 10 long curtains made out of linen. 11 curtains made out of goat hair formed a tent over the tabernacle. Inside the tabernacle, the people made a veil. They made a wooden box covered in gold called an ark, a table, a lampstand, and many other parts. Every part had a special purpose. God told Moses to bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron put on special holy garments, and Moses anointed him to be priest. Aaron's sons were also anointed to serve God as priests. Before, God had led the Israelites from a cloud. Now the cloud covered the tabernacle. God's glory filled the tabernacle. God made a sign for the people. If the cloud covered the tabernacle, the people would stay where they were. When the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the Israelites would move and take the tabernacle with them. The cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle during the day, and fire was inside the cloud at night. All the Israelites could see it as they traveled. God told the Israelites to build a tabernacle where he would dwell with them. God wants to be with his people. As a part of his plan to save sinners, God sent Jesus to dwell on earth with people. A lot was going on in that video, huh? Yeah? You guys catch all of it? Yeah? You want to tell me back all the video? No, maybe not. So what was, or what did God tell Moses? To, what did, instructions did he give to build what? What was it? He said it in a whole bunch. The tabernacle. All right, Elijah. Give me your best description, okay? All right? Of what is it? What is the tabernacle? I mean, what do you guys think? You, you guys, do you hear what Elijah said? He said the tabernacle is a tent. Do you agree with that? They're undecided. <laughs> so, you're right. It's a tent. And God gave him special instructions about how to build that tent. Kind of gave us an idea. We talked about the people that were special that built it, the different things, all these different things about how to construct it, what kind of materials to use. Listen, girls. Shh, shh, shh. But so they built this special tent, and the special tent told them that God was with them. All right? But as the video told us at the very end, it said the tent was showing us that one day God will always be with us. Not just in a... Uh, symbolic tent out in the wilderness that had a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud that showed us God was with us. 
But a day would come when Jesus would come and be inside of us, live in us if we believe in Him. Now, has that day already happened? Yeah. Jesus has already come. Jesus has already died on the cross for our sins. He has already arose from the dead. The Bible says if we believe in Him, Jesus will work in our hearts, that He'll dwell within us. Uh, so today, as you look at the tabernacle a little bit more in Children's Church, think about it. It is a way that God was showing His people of some future promise that He would always be with them. So let me pray for us, and then you guys can go to Kids' Church. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these kiddos. Thank You for their energy, their excitement. Lord, I just pray that um, as they study more and more about the tabernacle today and all the instructions You gave, Lord, how you help them to see that that was your presence among them. Lord, help them to see that, Lord, you can be at work in their hearts if they'll simply trust in Christ. So, Father, I pray today for these little ones that don't know you yet, that you'll use today's lesson and the days that unfold from here, Lord, to soften their hearts and prepare them to trust in Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you're heading out that way. Miss Julie's headed over there. All right. Let's stand for our offertory hymn. It is Footsteps of Jesus, number 43. Let's stand together. Where'er they go, though they lead o'er the cold or mountains, seeking his sheep, or along Basilom's fountains, helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway. steps of Jesus where'er they go. If they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly, serving the Lord. Footprints of Jesus that make the Where'er they go Then at last when on high we seize us Our journey done We will rest where the steps of Jesus End at his throne Footprints of Jesus That make the pathway steps of Jesus where'er they go. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again, Lord, to come and worship you. Father, we just pray for obedience and courage, Lord, to go and tell others that you would have us to do, Lord. Lord, I pray for Brother Lucas today. I just pray that you would anoint him with the words that we're looking to hear. Lord, I just pray we have many Lord that are sick today and I just pray a special touch and healing for the ones that are sick that are special for Miss Jackie and, and Ronnie Muse and Ronnie Clark Lord, and there's others Lord that I just pray for peace and comfort and a healing touch for them Lord I pray for this offering today I just pray that we would use it for your will these things I ask in your name Amen <laughs>
Amen. Thank you, Marianne. Well, I invite you to turn your Bibles this morning uh, to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, be starting in verse 24. A few weeks ago, we had our, our Vision Sunday, and uh, on that Vision Sunday, we reminded you of, of our, our mission statement, or our vision statement from a couple of years ago, one that we've sought to continue to come back to and um, use as a guide for our fellowship, as well as uh, you know where we, we feel the Lord leading us as we move forward. Now, I want to share it with you once again as you're turning in your scriptures. Transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are a fellowship of disciples devoted to God in our personal and corporate worship, committed to grow with other disciples in our understanding of God's truth, and appointed by Christ to be his witnesses in Calhoun, Georgia, and beyond. You know, as we work through that vision statement, that vision Sunday, and then we've kind of unpacked it at different times throughout the last year and a half to two years, we got it down to three words. Worship, grow, and share. Last week, we talked about uh, our vision as it connects to, to worship. And we spent time, again, in the book of Colossians, and Colossians uh, chapter 3, and talked about what it meant to allow the, the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts, to create a heart of worship, as well as what it meant to let the Word richly, richly dwell within us, to formulate a heart of worship. Well, this morning, as we continue unpacking this vision of what it means for us now in this context where we are as a fellowship we're going to look at uh, the grow aspect that focus on discipleship so again uh, directing our hearts to the scriptures here in colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 24 this is paul under the influence of the holy spirit recording this and writing this says now i rejoice in my suffer sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of the body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, again humbly thank You for Your Word, Your special revelation to Your people, Lord. Giving us uh, insight into who You are and and what you ask of your people, and how you work among us. And I pray this morning as we consider the vision that you've given us as a fellowship to, to be faithful disciples, to grow in you. Lord, this passage of Scripture would encourage us and remind us of the task in hand. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning as we work through this passage, we're going to see three aspects of, of discipleship, because that's the, the focus here. Now it is important for us to <coughs> important for us to acknowledge the uniqueness of Paul's ministry. You know, this is Paul writing here. He's writing to the church at Colossae, and he's he's noting his mission. He's noticing or noting his his uh, calling that God's given him. You know, if you're familiar with the New Testament or spent time in Scripture, you know that Paul had a special mission. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. You know, prior to this, leading up to redemptive history. Uh, the gospel was revealed, obviously, to the Jews, and that was, and in fact, Christ Himself was a Jew. But there, as after the uh, the ascension of Christ, and we see that the the coming of the Holy Spirit, we see the church begin to explode in growth. We see it, the kingdom of God begin to expand, and God anoints Paul in a special way to be that ambassador of hope to the Gentiles, to those that were not Jewish people. As I look around this room, I'm. Pretty sure that's all of us. We're Gentiles. Um, if you've got some Jewish descent, I apologize. I'm not looking over that. I just, you know, for what I know of you. All right, we're Gentiles. And, and Paul began that ministry there, and God continued to, to multiply that and expand that through other folks as well. So as we look at this, we have to acknowledge this is a specific calling that Paul has. But as we unpack this calling and this, this uh, glimpse into his heart that he provides for us, we'll see also that this is for us. These challenges, these, 
these exhortations, these encouragements that he's sharing points to our mission as well if we're a follower of Christ, if we're a disciple of Christ. So as we work through Paul's account here, we'll, we'll see three things. We'll see that there should be a fearless discipleship among God's people. There should be a faithful discipleship, and there should be a focused discipleship. Again, returning to, to thinking about Paul and his journey, you know, many of us are familiar with the fact that, you know, Paul, you know, of course, started out as, <laughs> as a leader among the Jewish community. He was, a, he was one of the, the top teachers, if you will, trained under the greatest teacher, and so on and so forth. But he was hostile against the early church. He was hostile against those followers of Christ. In fact, the first uh, introduction we have to Paul or, or Saul at the time in the Scriptures is he's there giving approval of someone's uh, execution. When Stephen is being martyred and they're throwing rocks at Stephen to kill him, they lay their, sh- their coats, their cloaks at Paul or, or Saul's feet. And it says he's there giving approval talks also in the, in the book of Acts how he uh, would go to different places and, and take Christians and bring them to prison and, and he'd lead them away to be executed. All these different things. He was breathing, as the scriptures say, he was breathing out murderous threats. He was an enemy of the cross. He was an enemy of the church. But then one day, on his way to fetch Christians, if you will, to persecute Christians, he encountered Jesus. And everything changed. He went from being an enemy, a persecutor of the church, to a proclaimer of the truth because he had an encounter with the risen Christ. And he was given this mission that we've noted earlier, a mission to the Gentiles. Now, as we think of Paul's story, I encourage you to think of yours. Maybe you're like, wow, you know, I wasn't quite that now. I wasn't you know, out breathing murderous threats and trying to persecute Christians or anything. But there was a time when you were an enemy of God. Whether you like it or not, all of us were. And we've talked about this before. Because of our sinfulness, because of our, the corrupt hearts that we have, we stood as an enemy of the cross, an enemy of God that, that, that forsook the blessings of God. But if we're here today and we're a follower of Christ who say we're a Christian, there came a time when Jesus showed up in our life and changed us. And because of that, He has given us a mission. He's given us a stewardship and called us to be fearless in seeking to fulfill that stewardship, seeking to to tell others of the gospel. And we see this in this passage, as we noted earlier, the stewardship that Paul's given is, is to make the word of God fully known. God has moved such in his life, has revolutionized his perspective, changed his life, changed his identity you know, even so much so that he was once known as Saul, now he goes by Paul, and some say, well, see, that's a, that was more so he just changed uh, what type of name he wanted to be called. He was always called Paul. He was always called Saul. It depends on the audiences around. But we see that uh, even in the, the writing, though, it's changed just to reflect the, the, the identity that was uh, transformed. But as he moves forward, he's seeking to make God's name known or the truth known to all people. And we see here that he's willing to do whatever it takes. You know, as we reflect in this passage, it says, I rejoice in my suffering. Paul was willing to go through suffering to make the the name of God uh, known, the truth of God known, fully known. You know, so again, some of us that know his story, you know that he was persecuted. He was stoned himself, left for dead. There was times where he had to take some extreme uh, escape routes out of places so he could not get killed. We know that he was arrested. We know he was in prison. We know that he was shipwrecked. All these different things. He was bit by a snake. All these things happened to him as he sought to make the truth of God known to all people. He was willing to do whatever it took. In fact, you get a glimpse of that here in this passage. I re- rejoice. He took joy in it for suffering and for your sake. In the flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. Now, he's not saying there that Jesus didn't do enough. I don't want you to read that. He says, I'm filling up what was lacking in Christ's affliction. No, basically what he's saying is, I have been found worthy to be persecuted for Jesus' namesake. People have looked at Paul's life, or they looked at Paul's life, and they saw saw Jesus, so therefore they persecuted Jesus, then they persecuted Paul. Because he was equated to be on the same page with him. They were equated to be of the same school. They were equated to be... He was equated to be a follower of Jesus. And if Jesus was worthy of affliction, Jesus was worthy of suffering, then so was Paul. And that's what the world viewed it as. 
as we bridge the context, thinking about our story, those that were once enemies that were brought into the fold, those that were given the stewardship to make the word of God known to all, are we willing to do whatever it takes? Are we willing to, to, to make disciples of all nations as we're commanded to do? Are we willing to, to face the persecution? You know, just as Adam reminded us this morning, talking about the Chosen series, which is a, a wonderful series if you haven't checked it out. And I think some of it's available on Amazon Prime, the old season or something. It's a free commercial there for you, but it's a great series and it gives you a perspective on things. But we're not called to be passive followers of Christ. We're not called to be passive Christians or passive discipleship or disciples. We're to be active. We're to be fearless, bold, the word we heard earlier. Making sure that those around us know the truth. Know who this Christ is that's changed our life. Because if He's indeed changed our life, that's something that we won't be able to contain and, and it transforms all that we are. The second thing that we see here is we think about being a disciple of Christ, we're fearless, but also we're faithful. We're faithful to the truth. Again, looking at Paul's uh, particular context there, uh, looking in verse uh, uh, 26, or excuse me, I'll start in 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Again, backing up just a second, you know, this stewardship that God's given to make the word of God truly known it's done, yes, for God's glory, but it's also done for the rest of, rest of us. Think about Paul, if he had sat on the message and not told the Gentiles. Think about maybe that lady or, or friend or parent or pastor or teacher or, or whoever that shared the gospel with you. What if they had sat on it and never told? But they were willing to tell. They were willing to show the love of Christ and it made all the difference in your life and we're called to do the same. Just as Paul was, we're called to be faithful to, to that, that message as well. Faithful discipleship. We're faithful to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Now, real quickly, I think it's helpful for us. You know, you know, we're on this side of the fence, if you will, from the New Testament. We see the fullness of Scripture. We see how God revealed Himself in the Old Testament and then brought it in fullness in Jesus Christ and how it reflected in the, uh, the emergence of the early church and beyond that. But here in this first century, this is new. It was a mystery. You know, those that were Jewish, those that were Hebrews, they had an understanding that, that God had called Abraham. All right, and Many of us maybe know that story. God had called one man, Abraham. And he said, follow me and I will make you a blessing to all the families of the earth. Way back, we see that in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. Just a re repeating of that promise. He says, you follow me. And I will work in you in such a way you'll bless all the families of the earth. We start from one man, then we move to what? One nation. Israel. God's chosen people. In fact, that's the, the mentality, that's the understanding. When Jesus shows up on the scene and Jesus is, is a Jew, he's from that one nation. And then through the death, burial, and resurrection, we see he complete the redemptive work. And then as the early church emerges with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we see the mystery unveil. The mystery unveiled that Jesus not only died for the Jewish people, the, the nation of Israel, but He died for everyone. That all people may know who God is. That all people may be brought into the fold. That all people could be the children of God. That is that mystery that's been entrusted to Paul. And that's when he's going to these Gentiles, those that are not believers or those that are not Jews, he's telling them, you know, the, the, there may be some that say Jesus is only for you or only for the Jews, but I'm here to tell you Jesus died for everyone. And every person that draws breath can call out to him for salvation and be saved. That was Paul's mission. And I tell you, that mission is our mission. The mystery is clear. Christ came for all people. He came for you. He came for me. He came for every one of us in this room. All of redemptive history unveiled 
so that Christ would come and bring salvation for all people. Paul was faithful to that mystery. He was faithful. He was committed to share the riches of God's glory. As we see defined here, looking real quickly, verse 26, real quick again, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentile are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Listen to this. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The fullness of that mystery unveiled, the fact that Jesus died for all people, is the reality that now God that was once far off because of our sin has now redeemed us if we place our faith in Him, and He comes and lives, dwells within us, and transforms us, changes us. pushing the sinful, corrupt things out of our life and then drawing us close to, our, to Him and, and transforming us and, 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 and resulting as what we see in the, the fruit of the Spirit there and love growing in us and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness and faithfulness. All those things begin to work out in our life, begin to be exhibited in our life that, are, that is beyond our control. It's, it becomes very clear. It's nothing that we could do. We couldn't... We couldn't uh, cultivate enough love, joy, peace, patience on our own, but it becomes very clear that it's God at work in us. Very clear that the Holy Spirit is working in our life and transforming us in a way that all the glory is points to Him. And it also gives us this future hope, this hope of glory, a certainty, a certainty of what's to come. Christ dwelling in His people so that they may know what's to come. passage of Scripture that many of us are, are familiar with in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says this, In Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. You see, this hope for glory, this anticipation of the certainty is something that all of us have if we've heard the message, we've believed the message, we've had faith in who Jesus Christ is, and then He seals us, He secures us, and gives us a hope, a promise of what's to come, of that eternal inheritance. Paul was faithful to that message because he had experienced it in his heart, and he was faithful to tell other people there's hope for you no matter who you are. No matter if you're Jew or Gentile, no matter if you're uh, rich or poor, no matter if you're male or female, if you're slave or free, and then we go on and on and on and down the list and talk about all the distinction in humanity, but all humanity is welcome at the cross. Christ comes and He dies for all people, and that is a, a message that Paul says, I must make known to all. That is a message that we must make known to all. We're faithful to that message, committed to the sharing the mystery. So I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves, how committed are we to revealing the mystery to the world, helping them to see that Christ came for all people? You know, what are the things that, that we do on a regular basis, or how do we live our life? Does it point people to the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, the, the, the hope that only resides in Him. I guess another question we could ask ourselves is, do people believe us when we talk about Jesus? Do people believe by looking at your life, the way you live and the way you speak, that you have a hope that can save all people? They realize that you're a ministry, I mean, you're a, you're a minister of the mystery. That you've experienced a change because of who Jesus is, and that change can change their life as well if they'll simply trust in Him. Or do they look at us and they discount our message? They counter, discount our message maybe because of the patterns of the world, or maybe they discount our message because of the patterns of our life. Paul was faithful in his discipleship. 
Are we faithful to share the mystery that Christ came and died for all people? The third thing that we see as we consider Paul's discipleship and ours, a focused discipleship. Fearless, willing to do whatever it takes, faithful to the task at hand, and then focused. Looking in verse 28, talking about Christ. Christ, we proclaim warning, <coughs> warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom. Look at this last part. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. See, the goal of Paul's discipleship, the goal of Paul's mission was to present everyone mature in Christ. Now, let's, let's unpack that just for a moment, and then we'll dive a, a little bit deeper. To be mature in Christ, what does that mean? To be, to be brought to full maturity in Christ. Can I tell you, on this side of eternity, it can't happen. Now, we can progress to that point, but we won't be mature in Christ until we look into his eyes and he looks into ours. We see him face to face. You know, some of those blessed saints in our life, those loved ones that have already gone on to glory, they're mature in Christ. They're in his presence right now. But on this side of eternity, that's not something we can achieve, but we can work towards that end. As God works in us. As just as we talked about the transformation that heart happens in our heart, the fruit of spirit that comes to fruition. And Paul saw it that his goal, his mission as a follower of Christ, as one that's led by the Spirit, was to bring all to that maturity. To bring them up in such a way, or to, to guide them, to disciple them, to grow them in such a way that they're as far as they can get this side of eternity. They progressed to maturity to that point, knowing that the fullness of that maturity came when they stepped into the, uh, to eternity and met Jesus face to face. So when we consider that and understand what it means to present, present everyone in Christ, we first off have to do what? Introduce them to Jesus as far as the gospel. We've got to share the hope of Jesus Christ with them. Word that we've thrown around, evangelism. Tell them the good news. You know, one of the things that we're doing on Wednesday night right now with our kiddos and, and our Bible study and our missions time is, and I know they're probably getting tired of it already, but I don't care. We want them to understand what is the gospel. And then we want them to understand what is a testimony. What is a story with Jesus? As we consider what it means to present someone mature in Christ, we first have to introduce them to Jesus. They first have to understand the gospel Understand the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done on their behalf. And then to come alongside them and to disciple them. And in that discipleship, teach them the principles of multiplication as well. Not two times two is four. I was about to get that wrong. I was about to say something else. But just the reality of it is a true disciple is one who makes disciples. Multiplies. That's what Paul understood. We, we see that in his life. Is, is that something we understood? I, I pray it is. I know that's something over the last few years we've really talked about. You know, who are those Pauls in our life? People that are pouring into us. Who are those Timothys in our life? People we're pouring into. We've talked about having successive generations of disciples after us and, and us being in the line of someone's discipleship making. Paul understood, I want to present everyone mature in Christ for us. If we're a follower of Christ, we've been called to be a disciple, and we've been called to be a disciple maker, as we see reflecting the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Are we committed to that? Are we focused on that? That all may grow in their understanding of who Jesus is, so much so that they may tell others, so they may grow in their understanding of Jesus and who He is. So how can we do that? How can we seek to, to lead others to maturity in Christ? Again, by being intentional, by sharing the message of who Jesus is, and then, then pouring into people, doing life with people. You know, we've joked about it before. You know, a lot of times we celebrate when a, a young man or young woman or old man or old woman stirs the waters of baptistry and they're baptized and we're, we're excited with them. But then we just leave them, leave them on their own to figure it out. You know, whether it's a kid or whether it's an adult, we can't do that. That's lazy discipleship. 
We've got to pour into them. We've got to, to lead them. We've got to help them see that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you're a disciple that makes disciples, that you grow in your discipleship, and as you grow, you share with someone else so they can begin to grow. And it's the successive generations of discipleships that are, disciples that are made, this multiplication that happens. You know, as we consider this here on our campus, within our fellowship, what does it mean to be faithful in our discipleship? What does it mean to be focused, fearless? It starts with making the most of the opportunities we already have. I realize we are in some crazy times right now. and You know, we hear that in our prayer requests. We see that where we go with masks and all these different things. And, and people have different postures and approaches to just public life right now. And I understand that. Uh, and I think all of us are on the same page with that. But I want to encourage you. If you're a follower of Christ, you need to be intentional about your discipleship. You need to be in the Word personally, and you need to be in the Word with other people. You know, whether that you know, means being a part of some other uh, group that doesn't meet when we meet on this campus or, or whatever, so be it. But I want to encourage you, if you're not involved in a, a Bible study right now with other believers, to take steps this week to get involved with other believers in Bible study. To be a part of the disciple-making process. Whether that means you, you're making a commitment, I'm going to be there Sunday morning early and I'm going to be a part of a Bible study group. We've got teachers galore and you know we can make more classes if we need to. The Lord, will, If the need's there, the Lord will raise up a leader. Or maybe that means you got to, the Lord's calling you to start a Bible study at work. Or maybe on campus or, or whatever. But you need to be in the Word with other believers. But also you need to be looking for people to, that need to hear about Jesus. That you can introduce to Jesus and then pour into them and be a part of their growth and just as much as they are a part of yours. Being committed to that. Honestly, as we think about this, as we think about being fearless, as we think about um, being faithful, as we be, think about being focused, it can be overwhelming. In fact, some of us may be thinking, that's impossible. You don't know my schedule. You don't know the things I struggle with. And can I tell you, you're right. It is impossible for you to do all by yourself. In fact, none of us in here can live the Christian life by ourselves. We all fail. But we're not alone. Look how this passage ends. And this is such an awesome end to this passage. Can I just tell you, every time I read this, it just brings the light to my heart. And look at it again. Paul says this, talking about being uh, the stewardship and being uh, going through suffering and, and making sure everyone's uh, mature in Christ. And he says this, For this I toil, this is why I work, I struggle with all His energy, that He powerfully works within me. You hear that? Does it say I struggle with my energy or how I'm working this out? No. All of it in Christ's power. Again, the mystery is revealed. Christ dwells within us if we place our faith and trust in Him. He's the one working in our heart to help us to be, to be fearless, to be faithful, to be focused. He's the one at work. Will it be a struggle? Yes, because your flesh is going to say, No way! I don't have time to pour into people. I don't have time to tell people. I'm not strong enough. I'm not uh, brave enough. I'm too shy. I can't talk. I got bad breath. I don't know. We come up with all kinds of excuses. And then the world says, no, that is an unpopular message. That's biased. That's bigotry. You're narrow-minded. All these things. And we say, well, can't do it. That's the struggle. But when we submit ourselves to who Jesus is and what He's doing in our life, we realize a struggle can be won because He's the one working in us. He's the one that's accomplishing the task. With Jesus at work in us, we can indeed be fearless. We can be faithful and we can be focused in making disciples. Disciples not only here in Echota Baptist Church, not only in Calhoun, Georgia, 
not only here, but in the United States and beyond to the very ends of the earth, if we'll simply trust Him and allow Him to work in our life and for Him to execute His perfect plan in who we are. Let us all, first and foremost, trust in Jesus for our salvation. And then realize He's done a work in us and He longs to reveal that work in our life and in the lives of other people as we seek to share with them who Jesus is and to make them disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. And we could go on all day. Let us be faithful to grow together. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your truth. We thank You for the power of it. Lord, I just pray for each one of us here, Lord, as we consider the task. We know we need to be telling people about Jesus. We know that we need to be studying the Word. We know that we need to instruct others, to teach them and admonish them, as the Scriptures tell us and as this passage says. But, Lord, we create all kinds of excuses, and the world tells us to abandon the cause. But, Lord, Jesus Christ says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And, Lord, help us to do it. Help us to be fishers of men. Help us to go and to tell, to reach into the the highways and the byways, the classrooms, the, the workplaces, wherever you take us, Father. Help us to be there. Help us to be ready to share the mystery that is Jesus Christ that has come and died for all people. Father, move among us. For some of us in this room, we need to uh, commit our life to you for the first time. I trust in Jesus for our salvation. Uh, I pray that today is that day. Lord, I'll be down front. And just, Or maybe they need to speak to someone they're sitting beside. Lord, just trust you. There's others in this room, Lord, that need to repent. They need to turn away from maybe some sin in their life or, or maybe some misconceptions or, or just um, laziness. Lord, that's kept them from being a, a faithful follower of Christ. And I just pray that this morning you'll point that out to them and help them to take practical steps to be more faithful and to yield to the work of Jesus, who's the one who will accomplish the task. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Come and lead us, brother. No turning back.